and we fight Visor Three, leader of the Yerk invasion of Earth, the only Andalite controller in existence, the only Yerk who, like us, has the power to morph, the murderer of Elfangor. He's a killer. He's a destroyer. He's a lover. He's a sinner. He plays his music in the sun. Oh, he's a joker. He's a smoker. He's a midnight toker. Boom. You should have won. Sorry. When I open the book, you know. I didn't know what I was going to find. I saw the flash of light just before the Oh, what a beautiful sight. Then I was flying. I was flying. Oh, super book. Well, I was afraid to look. Super book. Oh, super book. Nobody agrees on everything. And it's a challenge to create a story that focuses on a radical, off-center idea and have it accessible to as many readers as possible. If it's ham-fisted and preachy, then those who disagree on the stance will be put off and possibly offended. There are two things you can do to minimize that. First, present the idea as openly as possible, so that more people observing your story can approach the project on their own way. For example, in the production of Jesus Christ Superstar, it is neither confirmed nor denied whether Jesus Christ is the actual super-powered Son of God or just a rather popular martyr. This allows Christian, non-Christian, and non-religious alike to approach the work in their own terms and make up their own minds concerning the actions of this fellow named Jesus. Of course, there's nothing wrong with art aimed at a specific audience, but if, say, you're writing monthly books aimed at a large audience of impressionable children and young adults, then you should be careful about how you present your points. Young people aren't stupid, but they also aren't complete, and presenting the message of industry bad with a narrow, there's only one way to think about this approach, is making up their minds for them, and that's called propaganda. Secondly, you need to be honest. Nothing is ever black and white, and saying otherwise is lying. You can have a negative opinion of Republicans, but it'd be dishonest to say that all Republicans are scumbags. They're all trying to do what they believe is right, and have just as many flaws as Democrats, Libertarians, Communists, Anarchists, or Shaq. Case in point, in the last book, Number 8, The Alien, we're given our first real look at the shades of gray in the Yerks and the Andalites. Yeah, the Yerks may be the opposition, but they are capable of compassion. And yeah, the Andalites may be our biggest ally, but the sample of Andalites we've had so far include one that was dying, one that was a confused child, and then a whole bunch of dicks. We can no longer say that either side is truly good or truly evil. Okay, you know I'm going somewhere with this, so the question is, what's my beef this time? There are two main themes in this book. One on the side of the philosophical, which is handled fairly evenly, except for the way it's wrapped up, which I'll address later, and one on the side of political, which is totally skewed, which I'll address right now. This story revolves around the Yerks gaining control of a logging industry on the, as a way to clear out the local forest in search of what they believe to be Andalite bandits. The problem is that at no point does the book make any attempt to differentiate between a Yerk-controlled logging company and a normal Earth logging company. This is how the book sums up logging in general. No way, I cried. The others were less upset. So what? Marco asked. So habitats will be destroyed. So animals will be made homeless. So old growth trees will be chopped down to make plywood, I cried. That's so what? No counterpoints are ever given, just Marco going so what a few times made to look like a jerk about it. Now, I spent ten years of my life in a small town in Idaho based around logging, and while I was never personally involved with the trade, I did pick up a thing or two about it, namely that logging, at least American logging, is handled with care, and actually offers benefits to woodland areas. For example, thinning forests can greatly reduce forest fires, which I think are a bit more destructive for the little woodland creatures if you ask me. Now, I know a lot of people who disagree with thinning, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with debate, but this book doesn't offer debate. It offers up what it believes to be a solid fact that all logging is wrong, be it man-made or alien-made, and leaves no room for discussion. This is largely a problem with Cassie-narrated books, which is why I approached them with a bit of dry vomit in my mouth. 
But the whole logging thing is the secondary theme to the story, and the primary theme is handled far better, if not perfectly. Well, with that off my chest, let's get into the review proper. The book opens with Cassie and Rachel after school in science class, trying to get a rat to find a nut at the end of a maze. It turns out that Cassie needs this rat to find the nut so that she can get a C instead of a D in this class. Yeah, Cassie is failing science, and not just science, middle school science, back when you could still put baking soda and vinegar into a Play-Doh volcano and pretend you're learning something. The rat can't find the nut, and I'm not sure why it matters, as there's no teacher supervising the experiment, and no way for Cassie to get a grade in the first place. Well, Cassie is a D student, so she decides the best course of action is to morph the rat and run the maze herself. And instead of keeping Rachel around as a spotter, she makes Rachel morph rat too. Because, you see, Cassie is a moron. As rats, they discover that the ceiling fan is preventing the smell of the nut from getting around, which they totally could have discovered as people. And then the scene goes from stupid to bizarre, as two teens enter the room, see three rats, and decide out of the blue to squish them. With their hands. The hell? I know kids are assholes who fry ants with magnifying glasses, but where did this sudden blood thirst come from? Ah, fuck it. This is another one of those stupid opening scenes that have nothing to do with the rest of the book. Let's just skip ahead. The Animorphs meet in the barn, and Tobias brings up the Yerks Logging Company plot. The Yerk Lumberjacks have a base in the woods protected by a force field and armed guards, and when the Animorphs go in for a closer look, they get attacked by nets. Well, more logical than trying to lasso an Andalite. They barely manage to escape and call it a night. Cassie's dad gets a call about a burned skunk on the side of the road, and he and Cassie go to pick it up. Cassie recognizes the burn from that of a Yerk Dracon beam and begins to feel bad. Cassie's dad tells her that life's rough, and that's just the fact of it. Cassie, you and your dad is calling you on your bullshit. You might want to start listening to other people. That said, it's nice to have some moments with Cassie's family, who are the most underdeveloped thus far in the series. What's more, it turns out the skunk recently gave birth, meaning Cassie feels even worse. At the mall, the Animorphs form a plan. They'll morph termite, dig under the force field, and slip into the base that way. This plan freaks everyone out, as it brings back horrible memories of morphing ants in number 5 the Predator. It's rightfully pointed out that termites are more closely related to cockroaches than ants, but any hive-minded insect can't be a good thing to morph. That night, Jake causes a distraction while the rest of the animals slip out under the force field. However, they soon come across the termite colony and find themselves without any free will, serving the termite queen. Cassie manages to snap out of it long enough to kill the queen, and they morph out into the base, with Cassie pretty damn shaken. Axe hacks into the Yerk's computer and learns that they need a majority vote from a three-man committee in order to log here. One man said yes, one man said no, and the third man, a big honcho, is due for a visit before he gives his vote. The Animorphs then escape. This is where the primary theme of the book rears its head. That night, Cassie contemplates nature, and for the first time, considers it ugly instead of beautiful. I love animals. I've been raised all my life around them. I love nature, but what did I really know about it? I have been more animals than many people ever see in a lifetime. I have flown with the wings of an osprey. I have raced through the ocean in the body of a dolphin. I have seen the world through the eyes of an owl at night, and smelled the wind with all the keen senses of a wolf. I have flown upside down and backwards in the body of a fly. Sometimes I go out into the far fields at night and become a horse and run through the grass. And everything I have been. Every animal is either killer or killed. In a million, million battles all around the world, on every continent, in every square inch of space, there was killing. From the great cats in Africa that cold-bloodly search out the young and weak gazelles, to the terrible wars that are fought out in anthills and termite colonies. All of nature was at war. And at the top of all that destruction, humans killed each other as well as other species. And now those same people have been enslaved and destroyed by the Yerks. Nature at its finest. Cute, cuddly animals are slaughtered to live. The color of nature wasn't green. It was red. Blood red.